So next up, um, we have Vera Ong. Vera is a student currently at University of Hawaii. And uh, she did her undergraduate work before that at UCLA, where she started getting interested in neurosurgery and worked with Dr. Isaac Yang, who I'm very happy to see is on the meeting this morning. Welcome, Isaac, from the West Coast. Um, Vera did a number of projects with Dr. Yang uh, over the course of the last seven years um, and has been pursuing an interest in neurosurgery ever since. She is going to be speaking to us today about uh, acoustic tumors. So Vera, I'll turn over the screen to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Morgan Stern. Also wanted to say a big thank you to everyone for making me feel so welcomed here at Mount Sinai. I couldn't have asked for a better experience. Um, so today I'll be discussing hearing preservation in vestibular schwannomas, radiotherapy versus microsurgery. Um, and I am by no means an expert at this topic, and I'm fully aware that I am in a Zoom room full of experts, but I'm very excited and I look forward to anything that you may want to highlight or share either during or after my talk. All right, so an overview of today's talk, I'm going to go over the current literature on this topic, and then I'll discuss radiotherapy, microsurgery, and then limitations for my discussion today. So as a background, we did a bibliometric search on the most highly cited publications on this topic. In a row, we found that there are three main management approaches, the weight and scan approach, radiotherapy, and microsurgery. So the overarching question of my discussion today is what is the best way to treat vestibular schwannomas while minimizing functional complications? So in terms of radiotherapy, to better understand this more, we did a study that examined the three different modalities of radiotherapy. Um, notably, there were stereotactic radiosurgery, fractionated, and hyperfractionated. We did this through a retrospective electronic chart review within a single academic medical center. And just as a reminder of the different definitions for radiotherapy, on the high extreme, we have the stereotactic radiosurgery at one fraction of 12 grays, and then the other extreme, the lower extreme, is the fractionated, which is administered within 5.5 weeks at a lower dose of 1.8 grays. And in the middle, we have hypofractionated, administered at three to five fractions and three to five grays per dose. And an important thing to consider with radiotherapy is the cochlear dose, um, because with a higher dosage of radiation that also uh, potentially damages the cochlea as well, and also is a risk factor for hearing preservation or hearing loss. So demographics of our patients that we saw, age notably was significantly different amongst the groups and also follow-up time too. Um, in terms of baseline as well, we noted that tumor volume was about the same for each. Um, Non-serviceable hearing was also different between the groups and disequilibrium as well. Um, of note, more patients who received stereotactic radiosurgery also, like they had non-serviceable hearing in the beginning, um, potentially pointing that those with more severe cases um, were predisposed to get stereotactic radiosurgery. For hearing preservation definition, we use the Gardner-Robinson scale, um, saying that a class one or two preoperatively maintained postoperatively showed good serviceable hearing. And a Gardner-Robinson scale is based off of the pure tone average, based off of decibel threshold and also word discrimination of the 50-50 rule. For our results, these were the number of cases that we identified from our institution. Notably, tumor control rate was similar amongst all three cohorts. In terms of our results, hearing preservation rate was different and onset of tinnitus was different also between the three groups. And when we dived into this a little bit more, time to hearing loss was shown to be significantly different between the SRS and FSRT groups. Within these Kaplan-Meier curves, we're able to show that the SRS cohort, as we predicted based off of the cochlear dosage, showed to have increased incidence and shorter time to hearing deterioration. However, it was interesting to see that the FSRT cohort showed increased incidence and shorter time to tinnitus onset in contrast. So from this particular study, we're able to show that radiotherapy can help conserve neurologic function, notably hearing preservation, Five-year tumor control rate was similar among all the three groups. FSRT showed to have better hearing preservation, but tinnitus was another consideration to have with this particular treatment modality. Now, in terms of microsurgery, there are three different approaches. There's the translabyrinthine, with a hearing preservation rate known to be 0%. Middle cranial fossa, hearing preservation rate of 55 to 86%, as seen within the literature. And the retrosigmoid approach from what we saw 
um, the hearing preservation rate was still unknown. So that's how brought, brought us to this other study published in Red Journal um, to, for us to be able to find this aggregated mean for the hearing preservation rate for the retrosigmoid approach. And we did this through a meta-analysis. We used PubMed and Cochrane. Um, we also tried to study for study bias along with Eggers test and funnel plot asymmetry. This was our um, PRISMA guidelines um, related review. Uh, we got 16 studies by the end of it. And we again used the 50-50 rule for hearing preservation using the Gardner Robinson scale and also the AAO HNS scale as well. We were able to evaluate over 3,000 patients, and here's the mean of mean of age and also mean of mean of follow up time. This was the aggregated averages that we found for the hearing preservation rate for the retrosigmoid approach, finding a fixed effects model of 31% and a random effects of 35. Based off of the particular studies we had, we were also able to determine hearing preservation rate based off of different sizes. Notably, tumors that were larger than two centimeters had a hearing preservation rate of about 11.8, um, whereas those zero to 20 millimeters were 35.4 and those intracanalicular were 47.7. And we did not find any publication bias based off of our Eggers test and lack of funnel, funnel plot asymmetry. So overall, we were able to find from this study that hearing preservation rate is dependent on a lot of things, notably tumor size. Um, and it's very critical to discuss all these different aspects with patients in collaboration with the patient in terms of figuring out how to best treat each patient case. So the overall findings of my study have shown that radiotherapy FSRT is roughly around 70 to 90. Hypofractionated is still unclear given the fact that it was a clinical trial when we were looking at it um, with limited a number of patients and also limited follow-up time. Single fraction is about 40% with 12 grays. In terms of microsurgery, we, we are aware that translab is about 0%, MCF 55 to 86, and the breakdown of retro SIG. So overall, the overlying story of the, all the projects that I discussed today, surgery is uh, recommended for those tumors greater than two centimeters. And for those less than two centimeters, we would recommend radiotherapy. Um, and we've also discussed the different modalities of radiotherapy as well. So some limitations from the studies that I've discussed today, they're all retrospective. It's also, we discuss a limited follow-up for a slow growing tumor as well. Um, that's something that we'd wanna look into in the future. I'm also comparing, I'm comparing hearing preservation between different studies too. We had limited sample sizes and there's also post-operative outcomes that weren't considered like quality of life, facial nerve hearing, facial nerve preservation as well. Um, so in summary, there's different management approaches, observation with MRI and hearing test, microsurgery, radiotherapy management overall is an accumulation of multiple different things, patient's medical history, including their age, tumor size, location of the tumor progression as well. So some future steps that I'd want to pursue at the residency program where I would match, I want to do more prospective clinical studies, look more long-term at the radiotherapeutic outcomes. Also, I'd want to look at um, other potential approaches that are available to treat vestibular schwannomas. I'd also want to assess larger tumors in terms of getting a subtotal resection and then treating the residual with radiation and also properly identifying patient populations and better determining um, the right strategy for each patient population for treating vestibular schwannomas. Also very interested in looking at molecular markers for vestibular schwannomas too. I'd like to say a big thank you to my mentors, Dr. Isaac Yang, Dr. Manish Agi, and also thank you, Dr. Yang, for coming on. I know that it's like 4.50 a.m. right now in California. It really means a lot that you're here to support me. Um, also, a big thank you to Dr. Maya Harari, the Yang Lab Research Team, Dr. William Obana from the University of Hawaii. Also, thank you to all my funders, the Carolyn L. Kukain AOA Student Research Fellowship, the Hiromu Matsumoto Scholarship as well. Here are my citations. And thank you so much for listening. I'm now open for questions. Hey, Vera, Good really job, nice. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Peter. Go, go ahead, Rash. Go ahead. Um, so really nice presentation, Vera. Very well studied, very well presented. Um, you know, one of the interesting things for me um, in acoustic tumor population is exactly what Dr. Bederson was mentioning in conference yesterday morning, that there are is this subpopulation of tumor cells that, and these types of tumors that don't behave typically. And I think within this population, all of us tend to think of them as homogeneous in their behavior and in terms of 
some of what we believe to be the response to radiation, but there certainly is a subpopulation that doesn't respond as well. And I've always been curious if that's, you know, um, a different profile altogether and whether there may be an underlying genetic or mutational, you know, difference. And I'm just wondering, I know you didn't study this specifically, but if you came across um, a population of patients in which either they didn't respond to radiation or whether you noticed anything for any genomic studies. Um, I recognize that's not what you looked at, but I was just curious if you came across that. Right, thank you for that question. Um, one population group that's notable for having a different form of vestibular schwannoma is those patients with NF2. Um, a lot of times we would discuss those patients um, in a different way. Um, unfortunately, we haven't, or I personally have not been able to work with the molecular part for vestibular schwannomas, but that's something that I would want to consider in the future. Yeah, I think NF2 definitely is different. I think there is an underlying difference for sure in their mutational profile. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? And thanks again to Dr. Yang for joining us for this one. Thanks for letting me crash. <laughs>